Okay, let's start with some introductions. So, as I said, welcome. It's an absolute honor to have 300 of you guys here today. Thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday evening or whatever time it is around the world where you guys are. I think we've, we've had people from all over the world join us over the last couple of months. So thank you and we're honored to have you here today for this very, very special um, ENT webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Azeem. I am a junior doctor in central London and one of the co-founders of Bite Medicine. We've been offering a bunch of free webinars for you all um, during quarantine. So please check out um, our previous webinars on www.bitemedicine.com forward slash watch. Um, please join our Facebook group, Bite Medicine for Students. This is where we have all of our updates um, and our updated schedules, etc. So please check that out as well. Um, so yeah, thank you for joining us today. So I would just like to introduce our very special guest, Mr. Joseph Magnali. Um, he, if we could pop onto the next slide, Joe, that would be great. Oh. <laughs> so my extravagant introduction of Mr. Magnali. So Joe is a consultant ENT surgeon um, at UCLH. He's based at the Royal National ENT Hospital. Um, I actually discovered Joe online on Instagram. Um, so please make sure you check him out at Ear Surgeon Joe. He has some fantastic bite-sized ENT tips. Um, and as I'm sure all of you guys will probably agree, ENT is not taught particularly well at medical school. Um, and it's an absolute honor to have Joe here today um, to run us through some ENT emergencies um, and common conditions um, that are seen in, in A&E and in general practice as well, um, to really help you guys refine your skills and, and to have someone um, as high profile and eminent as yourself, Joe, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Joe subspecializes um, in the cochlear implant team within UCLH. Um, and he'll be happy to take a bunch of your questions about ENT and we'll do a full Q&A at the end as well. Um, but without further ado, I will put myself on mute and leave you in Joe's capable hands. So thank you once again, Joe, for being here today. Thanks, Azim. Thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, let me just check that I can advance these slides. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm pretty gobsmacked that we've got over 300 students logging in on a Saturday evening. Um, I sort of think if I had had that much dedication, I wonder what I could have achieved, but um, I guess there's extra pressure on me to make this interesting. So I haven't got the chat open, but um, if um, I've, I've asked Azeem to just um, give me a nod if there are sort of flurry of a particular question. So we'll start off with this question. Um, I'm gonna set this video going and um, yeah, so a 30 year old male with haemophilia A presents to A&E and his nose has stopped bleeding. Which of these has no place in the management of nasal bleeding? So hopefully I can stick this on. Uh, actually, Azeem, I don't, oh, hold on. Uh, yeah, there you go. We can, do you want me to relaunch the poll? Yeah, go on, if you yeah. can relaunch it for me. No problem. Hopefully you guys can all see that. So this one was actually on Instagram earlier, so uh, some of you might have seen the answer. Let's give it a bit longer and then we'll uh, reveal the results. Okay, give you five more seconds. Excellent, okay. So, the correct answer, one, just. So we'll, let's talk through this now. So let me just put that to one side. Good, okay, so nosebleeds. Okay, a very common ENT emergency. And, um, but of course you've all had nosebleeds. So it ranges from a very simple nosebleed to something that can actually kill. So, uh, and it's a very common condition that you'll see on call in ENT. Now, the reason I put that question in is because, I mean, I can't see your uh, videos, but if I was to ask you all to show me where on your nose 
you tell your friend because of course when you're a med student everyone asks you for the for the de facto advice on what to do so their nose is bleeding what do you tell them if i if, if i was to ask you where to press everyone presses somewhere different and it's amazing how a piece of incorrect advice has not only infiltrated the general public but also the medical profession as well and it's amazing how many people we we see and they come in and they say oh you know someone told me to lean back and hold the bony bridge of my nose but that that is wrong so if any of you decide to log off now take one thing away which is that it's the soft bit of the nose you sit up straight soft bit of the nose and you can put some ice in the mouth as well um, that is the way to that is that is the correct first aid for for, for nose bleeding um, if it doesn't stop after 20 minutes then it needs some it needs attendance to hospital and then we take things from there so the funny thing is about ENT you get about a couple of weeks max at med school and then suddenly you find yourself as the SHO on call for half of London and uh, and you're suddenly dealing with all these things so so this may be the only uh, explanation you get on how to deal with epistaxis so here we go PPs um, obviously totally in fashion at the moment but I've been barking on about it for ages because um, all it takes is for a patient who's had a nosebleed to cough and suddenly you've got blood in your face so don't underestimate the need to cover your eyes and um, and really gown up properly we don't take long histories in ENT but you want to get a quick idea for how much blood someone may have lost and also what side they're bleeding from so if it's one-sided it's more likely to be an anterior bleed Whereas if the blood is coming from both nostrils and through their mouth, it's more likely to be a, a posterior bleed. So get an idea for that. Get an idea for whether they've had any recent surgery. What's their medical condition like? So have they got any hypertension that's contributing to this? Um, are they going to be okay with a general anesthetic if it's needed? Blood thinning medications are really important. So finding out if they're on you know, anything that makes their clotting worse. And similarly, if you're able to stop the bleeding same day, are they fit for discharge? So, you know, what's their social situation? In a severe, any, if any, anything more than a very simple nosebleed requires the ABC respect you would give any other resource situation. So obviously, suctioning the airway for any clots, making sure that they have oxygen if needed. And obviously, circulation is the big one. So large bore IV cannula, bloods, uh, getting fluids in, getting a cross match, the usual sort of recess scenario. Because people can lose enough blood to, to get significantly sick from, from epistaxis. It shouldn't be underestimated. And then basically we have this stepwise way of stopping nosebleeds from very simple, non-invasive measures to much more extreme. So I'm just gonna go through that now. The first thing you need is a thudicum speculum. And that's what's shown in this picture. So the nasal speculum to open up the nose and use a headlight to shine your light inside the nose. And it's always good to decongest the nose to get a proper view. So we use this blue spray classically. It's a mixture of lidocaine and phenylephrine. And that numbs the nose and it um, reduces bleeding. So always use those two things when you're having a good look inside the nose. By the way, excuse my uh, little 10-month-old baby in the background if you hear him. Um, that's who it is, if you, if you can hear him. So, Right, so the first step for a simple bleed is silver nitrate. So you might look in the nose and you might see a bleeding point on the nasal septum. You can use these sticks which have silver nitrate on the end. You touch the nasal mucosa and it causes a chemical burn and stops the bleeding. And that will often work for most simple cases. Beyond that, the next stage is nasal packing. So starting with anterior packing, there are two main types. We've got rapid rhinos here, which are essentially uh, balloons that you insert into the nose and then inflate. And the second type, which I tend to prefer, are called Miracel nasal tampons, which is being shown here. And they essentially, you insert them into the nose and they swell up with blood and tamponade the, the nasal cavity. So the key thing here, and remember, you don't do much ENT and then suddenly you're faced with this on call. The, the key mistake people make is to try and 
put the tampon in that way. But of course, the nasal cavity is not shaped like that. So if you stick it in that way, it's just going to get stuck here. And you're going to end up with these sort of tusks out here. So if you don't want to get the mickey taken out of you, then uh, we call it the positive walrus sign because you end up you know, looking like you've got two tusks. But the main thing is to place it, put it in 90 degrees to the face so that it's going in this way. And that, and, and it will be sore. So you, you know, you need to decongest the nose, numb the nose, and one firm push, push it all the way in, um, so that it doesn't get stuck halfway. So if that doesn't work, then we've got the option of BIP, and BIP stands for bismuth iodoform paraffin paste, and that's what the yellow stuff is, which the ribbon is covered in, and we use these Tilly's dressing forceps to pack the nose. I can see the chat going off. So, um, okay, I'll come back to the, uh, I'll come back to the questions in, in a second. Okay, this is actually, I, I asked, uh, Azim very kindly uh, adopted this uh, diagram for me, which shows how to pack a nose. And it's not actually unrealistic. So the key thing is that you wanna get your first thread all the way to the back, okay? You don't want all the packing bunching up here. You wanna get it all the way to the back of the nose. And then, and then fill up like that, and so that it, it tamponades the nose. Okay, so we talked about a urinary catheter in those questions. Now, sometimes the bleeding comes from so far back that anterior packing won't quite get there. And this is where a balloon can really help. So what you do is you feed the balloon uninflated into the nose, like you would an NG tube. And then you look into the mouth and look for that tip to appear. And then you draw back slightly and then inflate the balloon. And that then, as you can see on here, tamponades the back of the nose and you can then pack the main nasal cavity with whatever you want. So that's where a, a urinary catheter comes in. Now, one thing to warn you you can end up inflating the balloon in the oropharynx and make patient choke and obstruct their airway. So obviously you don't want to do that. So if you see the patient choking and not able to breathe, just calmly deflate the balloon, pull it back a bit more and then inflate it um, as if you were meant to do it that way. Um, now, we also in the questions had a mention of an umbilical clamp. So that's where this comes in. So obviously if you leave it loose, it's not actually gonna um, sit properly. So you need to put an umbilical clamp to maintain tension on this catheter. So that's where the clamp comes in. Now, really important thing is you don't want the clamp pushing on the nasal, or on the nose, because you can get pressure necrosis and that's not good. So you need some kind of gauze or foam in this bit to stop the clamp pushing on the nose. That's really important. Okay, so if that doesn't work, then the next stage is to think about surgery. And there are loads of different things you can do to stop bleeding operatively. The most common is ligation of the sphenopalatine artery. And we do that endoscopically. Here's a picture of it being done. Endoscope in the nose. And essentially you lift a flap and you identify this artery and either burn it or clip it. Good. Okay, so another question. One year old child presents with unilateral brown nasal discharge. So I know the picture, there's slight bilateral thing going on, but, but for the purpose of this question, unilateral brown nasal discharge for over the last day, no eye signs, hemodynamically normal, not, not cooperative with further examination. What do you do next? Let's, uh, about let's put the next question on okay go for it while you're doing that i'll just check the chat With a Foley catheter, would you ask a senior to insert it? Or would you expect it as an F12? So that's a good question. Um, 
you're never too inexperienced to, to do these things. So essentially, you know, you're not too junior to do a Foley catheter at F12, but equally, I would always want my juniors to ask for help if they were unsure. So, uh, but no, you're never too, too junior for some of the stuff I'm, I'm covering here. Right, okay, we'll come back to the questions in a sec. Let's just give you five seconds. We've got a fairly split vote here. Okay, good, right. So, can you all see the results there? Just give me a yes in the chat if you can. Great, okay, good. Okay, the correct answer is lateral facial x-ray. Okay, um, I'll tell you a story. So when I was an SHO, I, when I was an anti-SHO, I was called down to A&E with this scenario. I had a four-year-old child, one-sided brown nasal discharge for a day, and really no other story. So whenever you get a child with unilateral nasal discharge, the first thing you want to rule out is a foreign body being stuck in the nose, because children put stuff in their ears, noses, and throats, okay? And so that's the first thing you want to ask. So I asked the... Um, child and parent, you know, whether there could be anything in the nose. It was a pretty vague history, probably not. Um, so then we tried to have a look. Child was batting me off, really uncooperative, didn't get anywhere. So there was enough suspicion that um, we should probably con consider whether there is a, a nasal foreign body there. So we arranged, so, th so the plan was that I would bring the child back the next day and we'd have a short general anesthetic um, and have a look. And just as they were leaving, I remember asking the mother, um, by the way, there's no chance that this could be a button battery because um, that, would change it, uh, that would change things because button batteries are very dangerous. And she said, um, no, not really. I don't think we have any batteries. And I said, well, if, if you're not sure, we can just do an X-ray. And I remember someone at the time in A&E saying, you know, what? are you sure like we we never do x-rays on children you're exposing them to radiation um and i think i called the reg and we you know we said well we're going to push on with this x-ray anyway so we took the child for the x-ray a few minutes later the radiographer comes by i was thinking he's going to tell me off for exposing a child to radiation and lo and behold there is a button battery sitting in the nasal cavity with no history of it so um it was just one of those moments, you, you don't have many moments in your medical career where you're sort of trying your best to not kind of, um, you know, do that sort of flicking thing, you know, being like, can't believe it, actually is a button battery. And um, so, and that triggered off, you know, emergency situation, because you have to get these things out quickly. And uh, I just remember finding it quite remarkable how awareness of button batteries, you know, some of the Theatre staff thought, well, if it's been in there all day, it could wait till tomorrow. But, you know, and since then, probably there's been a lot more public health stuff about the dangers of button batteries. And children have died from ingesting button batteries in this country. So um, I always think medical students are a really key um, part of public health messages. So go and tell all your friends, um, particularly those with kids, keep the button batteries away. Okay, so... Foreign bodies in nose that are not button batteries obviously still need to come out. Most often in children, although I have, I have pulled out a tic-tac from 24-year-old's ear before. Um, but uh, you basically get one good shot. So this is a scenario where if you don't think you're going to be able to get it out easily, and, you, and, and let's say you're an ENT, you're an A&E &E doctor or a GP trainee, refer it to ENT without trying because once you try, the child is going to be scared and they're not going to like you. So if you haven't got the right tools, it's better that an ENT, so ENT on call tries with the right kit um, and that they, they won't mind you referring without, without doing anything else. And the key thing is to get behind, if, if, if you've got a bead in the nose or something, get behind it. If you try and use crocodile forceps to pick it, you generally start pushing it further in. So that's the key message, get behind it and drag it down. That's the best way to get foreign bodies out. 
Same with foreign bodies in the ears. Um, again, it doesn't need to be done overnight unless it's a battery, um, but generally it's better to refer them to ENT who will have a microscope and the right kit to get stuff out. Okay. Now, if, if, if you've got an insect in the ear, then it's probably easy, it, it, it's preferable to drown it with oil first, uh, just in case it starts stinging on the way out. Um, the other one, interestingly, you see is spiders um, crawling into your ear in, at, at night. I had a GP colleague who said he felt something in his ear and lo and behold, there's a spider in his ear. Um, so, um, so uh, yeah, so insects, you see those as well. Foreign bodies in the throat. So what to say about these? Well, the first thing is coins in children, probably the most common thing you see where they've swallowed a coin and it gets stuck. You always get 50% of your investment. So you look at that and you think, oh, could be a 2p. It's always a smaller coin in once you get it out. So, um, but that is one of the best uh, feelings as uh, being an ENT trainee is, you know, pulling out the coin and giving it back to the parents. Um, ENT is a very practical specialty as, as you're seeing. So foreign body and throat, the key thing is it's a combination of a good history examination and investigations to create your index of suspicion. So if you've got a very clear worrying history of a sharp foreign body, examination might be normal and nothing shows up on x-ray, you still might take them to theater to get it out. Similarly, history might be fairly innocuous, but you find something on examination, or history and examination are both innocuous, but you find something on an x-ray. So you use all those things and you use flexible nasoendoscopy, which is putting a camera in the nose and into the throat with them awake. Um, that's also really helpful. Fish bones are really common um, and um, esophageal food bolus. So someone eating a bit too quickly or someone that's got an esophageal stricture. Generally, if it's a food bolus and there's no bone in the meal and it's not obstructing their airway, then you can sometimes wait 24 hours and give them some muscle relaxants and see if things settle. Um, but if, there's, if it's a sharp metal foreign body, coins, batteries, they need to come out straight away. So that's when you're gonna be calling the ENT uh, registrar on call. So not all fish bones show up on x-ray. And um, the way I remember this is that, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm working in, you know, your standard DGH, someone that's just gone down the chippy and had cod or haddock, then that usually shows up on x-ray. But if you're working, um, you know, in Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, someone's had a very posh breakfast fish uh, like herring or kipper, they don't show up on x-ray. So um, slightly in jest, but the key thing here is to not rely on the x-ray. If, if, if the bone doesn't show on x-ray, it doesn't mean it's not there. So that's why I came back to using history, ex examination and investigations to put them together to create your index of suspicion. Good, okay. So this slide basically to illustrate that x-rays can be quite difficult to interpret. And um, in the middle of the night, you may not have a radiologist reporting it that easily. So just to give you some idea, this is a lateral neck x-ray. This here is normal cartilage. And this is your trachea, and this is your esophagus, and the abnormality is actually here. So it's difficult to the untrained eye, and uh, you just get used to it. Good, okay, everyone happy so far? Uh, let me just check the chat. Okay, good. People are still here. That's, that's great. Um, good. Okay, we'll talk about ear infections. So quick revision of ear anatomy. You've got ear canal, eardrum, three hearing bones connecting to the inner ear. Okay. So most common infection you'll see is otitis externa. Okay. So that's an outer ear infection. So you get swelling and erythema in the ear canal and it also will produce debris. So the main thing to say here is, you know, Titus externa give drops. It's amazing how many patients you see out there that are given oral antibiotics for this, but that's not the correct treatment, give drops. So the main, 
the, the most common effective drops for this are sofridex and gentazone. Now they shouldn't be used if you've got an eardrum perforation. So a lot of people worry about giving those if they can't see the eardrum properly. If you're worried about that, you can give ciprofloxacin drops and that's safe to use if there's an eardrum perforation. So the key thing is drops and then if things get really clogged up with debris, then they need referral to ENT for microsuction. So first step, antibiotic drops, which usually contain a bit of steroid in, keep the ear dry, meticulously dry. And then the next step is microsuction, which is shown here. Ignore the fact that my colleague is not there below the elbow. Okay, sometimes the ear canal gets really stenosed and you can't actually get the drops in. And this is where a little pope wick is really useful. So it's a, essentially a tampon for the ear canal, basically. And you stick it in, put the drops on that, and that basically swells it and gets the drops to where they need to get to. You can leave it in for two or three days, bring them back to clinic, remove it, and by then the, the canal is usually widened and you can carry on your management. Necrotizing a tight external, slightly different beast. So can look similar when you look down the ear canal, but this is a skull-based osteomyelitis that is serious. And you need to think about this when you have a patient that is immunocompromised with pain and discharge from the ear. So we usually see it in patients that are diabetic or have had chemotherapy. And the, the things that, you should, that should make you think are night pain, granulations in the ear canal, like you can see on this picture, and otitis externa that's not getting better with conventional means. And untreated, it has, a, it has a fairly high mortality rate. So you need to spot this. It can cause sigmoid sinus thrombosis, meningitis, brain abscesses, and it can also knock off a lot of the lower cranial nerves. So you need to spot this. They need admission, they need an urgent CT scan, inflammatory markers, and essentially, our, in, a, in our hospital certainly, the infectious diseases team uh, work really well with us to um, start a long course of IV antibiotics. And usually this can be done in the community with a long line. And then diabetic control is really important. And obviously additional therapies depend on whether any cranial, cranial nerves have been affected. So necrotizing otitis externa, think about that. Otitis media, so that is inflammation of the middle ear cleft. So that's the eardrum and the space behind the eardrum. This is really common in children. They will often present with painful ear, fever, or in the younger children, they will often just pull and tug their ear. Um, they may feed poorly, become restless. You'll see this a lot in, in GP and a &E. It's very common. Now, the thing is that most cases are viral and will respond to analgesia alone. It's not necessarily sensible, therefore, to give antibiotics to all these cases. So when do you give antibiotics? There are a few key um, scenarios where you should give antibiotics. One is if they're under two years old. Secondly, if it's bilateral, so both ears. Um, any symptoms of local complications, so any facial weakness, dizziness, visual change, neck swelling, that should prompt a referral, urgent referral to inpatient ENT. If, they've, if the symptoms are severe or recurrent, or if it's not getting better after three days. So a lot of GPs will give a delayed prescription for that reason. They'll say, start the antibiotics if it's not getting better in three days. So there are complications of acute otitis media, which is why you need to think about that very carefully. One of them is mastoiditis, which is where the infection spreads to the mastoid bone behind the ear. You start to see this sort of um, uh, protruding of the ear, and then gradually you see erythema, tenderness and swelling behind the ear. At that stage, they definitely need admission. They definitely need IV antibiotics. And then it's a discussion with, um, well, ENT have a decision to make there um, about whether to scan now or treat and then scan. The CT scan is to look to see if there's any spread to the brain. Um, so, you know, before you take someone to theater to drain a mastoid abscess, you want to know if there's brain abscess as well. Good, okay, are we ready for another question? Uh, 
let's stick this on. So, question three, go for it. And I will add some encouragement that I don't expect any med students to get any of these questions right necessarily. So don't be disheartened if you don't know. Um, incidentally, um, the bike medicine team have asked me to do a talk next Saturday as well, where I'll cover this in a lot more detail. Okay, I'll give you a bit more time to pick an answer. And while you're doing that, I'll just... Uh, Two answers are the same. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. Actually, well spotted. <laughs> the baby's hungry. He's always hungry. His mummy's with him, so we're all good. He might even make an appearance if uh, if he gets enough requests. <laughs> oh my goodness. Right, I'm gonna end the poll in a second. Okay, so. It's a fairly fairly split vote, but the, the correct answer did, did win in the end. So this is a left conductive hearing loss okay so let me just close that and let's talk more about it so let's go back to the ear diagram ear canal eardrum malleus incus and stapes connecting to the inner ear so when there's a problem with the ear canal the drum or the three hearing bones or this middle ear space that's going to cause a conductive hearing loss and anything inner ear and nerve is sensory neural hearing loss. Now, for the purposes of this, what you need to know is 20 decibels and below is abnormal, okay? And if there is a gap between the bone line and the air line, it's conductive hearing loss, put simply. Now, there's, there's a whole lecture on this, but you know, to get you started, if there's a gap between the two lines, that's a conductive hearing loss. If both lines are low and level with each other, that's a sensory neural hearing loss. And we'll go into more detail on this next week. But um, that's what, just in terms of passing your exams, that's what you need to remember, okay? It's a left ear because the left ear has X's for air conduction. And it also, imagine you're looking at someone's face that's going to be their left ear. So that's how you remember that that's left bone conduction. Now, there's a lot more to say on that, but I'm just going to uh, leave it at that for now. Okay, so the reason this is important in an emergency situation is because if someone presents with sudden hearing loss, that is an emergency in the sense that if the sudden hearing loss is sensory neural, then they need emergency steroids to try and salvage it. In a bit, in, in the same sort of way that someone has a stroke, you want to act on it quickly. Now, the best option we have at the moment is steroids, but that situation may change in the coming years. So, sudden onset hearing loss, you find that it's sensory neural, start steroids. Usually, we give high dose PRED for a week. They should have an audiogram with the NT the next working day to demonstrate that it is a sensory neural hearing loss. And now we tend to give intratympanic steroid injection to try and salvage the hearing. Now, obviously you're not gonna have an audiogram everywhere, but you can do tuning fork tests. And I'm not sure if you will have covered this at 
med school, but essentially Rinny and Webbers. So again, I'm going to simplify this for now. If you've got a conductive hearing loss in an ear, then the the tuning fork is going to be louder behind the ear than in front of the ear. And the Weber is going to go to that side. So if you can remember that, that's going to set you up quite well. So conductive hearing loss, the tuning fork is going to be louder behind than in front of the ear, and the Weber is going to be heard in that ear. Okay. Just remember that and then take it from there. Okay. Good. Everyone happy? Shall I move on? Just ping a few yeses in the chat. Okay. Great. Super. So, this guy. You don't need to be a doctor to realise that this guy has a broken nose. But interestingly, he probably has the most famous broken nose because for many years, and you type in broken nose into Google, he would come up. I don't know if he knew that before he... Um, he volunteered to um, have that picture taken. But anyway, so what do you do with a broken nose? So you don't need to do x-rays. That's the first thing. And people will often ask you, is my nose broken? Well, you know, the nose is broken essentially if it's deformed. That's it. You don't need an x-ray to, to, uh, to, to show that. Usually when it's first broken, it's too swollen to push back. So we can do a procedure called a manipulation under anaesthetic where you put them to sleep and you basically crunch the nose back. And that's good for when the nose is shifted from the midline, so to the left or the right. And you can basically just crunch it back to the midline. Okay. Usually the best time to do that is around 14 days. So when someone comes in for with a broken nose, you usually arrange um, a delayed follow-up with the NT to assess once the swelling's gone down. And if there's deviation, then you they they get booked in for a manipulation under anaesthetic. The one thing you do need to do when you're seeing them the same day is exclude something called a septal hematoma, which is, if I uh, put to the next slide, essentially it's a hematoma which results in a boggy swelling in both nostrils. So that's something you need to rule out. If you leave that untreated, then the cartilage of your nose dies and you can get nasal collapse. So you don't want to do that. So if there is a septal hematoma there, it needs incision and drainage and a pack stitching in, usually the next working day. And if you're ever not sure whether, whether it's a septal hematoma, you can use an instrument and just push on it. It's usually boggy and fluid filled. Right, okay, what time is it? 20 minutes to go. I'm conscious that it's Saturday night, so I put this question in just to gauge, because obviously I can't see any of you. Um, so uh, I really just wanted to give you the option of, of bailing at this point. So uh, go ahead and um, fill in this question. <laughs> Joshua, some, some of the students want to say hello to Joshua. Do you want to bring him yeah. in? The, all right, yeah, he's just getting out of the shower. Okay, brilliant, thank you. All right, let's end that there. Hold on. Yeah. Okay, fairly unanimous to carry on, but I uh, fully respect anyone that wants to uh, go and do something else. All right, okay. So, throat, so. Sore throat, doctor, I've had a sore throat for a few days. Uh, you look in the throat, it looks like this. What is that? It's of course tonsillitis. Now the funny thing is, at med school, you get taught how to measure vibration sense in the big toe, but how often do you get to see tonsillitis and taught, taught how to treat it? That is, that is the madness of medical education these days but there we go you'll see loads of tonsillitis whatever you do whether it's a and e gp or or ent now the rule is 
if they can't eat and drink, then they need admission for IV antibiotics, okay? So um, if, they, if they can swallow, you can give oral antibiotics. If they can't swallow, you admit them for IV antibiotics and fluids. You wanna avoid amoxicillin because if it's glandular fever, then they can get a rash with amoxicillin. So you wanna give benzylpen and metronidazole usually. And you can also give dexamethasone to reduce the swelling. And that usually makes a big difference to their symptoms straight away. Take some bloods, do a monospot because the differential is glandular fever. So with a young patient, um, you want to think about this as the differential. The management is the same, but they will usually take longer to recover. And you want to advise them to avoid contact sports for three or four months because usually with glandular fever, the spleen can be enlarged. And if you get trauma to the spleen, you can get splenic rupture and, and um, internal bleeding. So that's, that's why it's important to, just to pick that up. Okay, so tonsillitis and Quincy often get mixed up, but a Quincy is, an ex is, is a complication of severe tonsillitis. And a Quincy is a peritonsillar abscess. So it's a collection of pus just next to the tonsil. Okay, now this left untreated can cause airway obstruction and sepsis. So it needs to be treated. And the way to treat it as, an e as, as the ENTSHO on call is to start your tonsillitis management and aspirate it. So what you do is you get the patient to open their mouth and you've got a headlight on and you use speculum with one hand and you take a syringe with a needle and basically stick it into the throat and aspirate the pus. Now that sounds really scary but actually you know if as long as you go straight, you're going to be fine. The carotid artery is kind of two centimeters that way, but no one hits that. Just You just go straight. And um, it's one of those things that is very satisfying because the patients get better straight away. And um, if you do get pus, then really you should sort of knife it and open it and let the pus out. And usually then you admit them for 24 hours, IV antibiotics, and they usually um, get better and you can discharge them on oral antibiotics. So tonsillectomy. Tonsillectomy is an operation we do a lot of. We do it for recurrent tonsillitis and also for obstructive sleep apnea. But however well the operation goes, a small proportion will have a bleed in the first two weeks. So we, we can never predict who that will be, but we know that however many tonsillectomies we do, a small proportion will bleed in the first two weeks. About 1% have it so bad that they need to go back to the operating theatre in an emergency. So as the junior on call in A&E or ENT on call, you need to be aware of how to manage this. So the first message is, if there's any story of bleeding, even if it's stopped, you should admit them for observation because it could be something called a herald bleed, which is a small bleed that is going to be followed by a much larger bleed. So always admit them, never send them straight home if the bleeding has stopped. Always let the ENT registrar on call know and have a good examination. Obviously, ABC scenario is, is, um, applies. People can get very sick from this. You can lose a lot of blood very quickly. So if the bleeding stops, you can manage things conservatively. So I always advise hydrogen peroxide gargles and the usual resuscitation and involve a senior early. If the bleeding stops, then you can manage things conservatively, but if bleeding carries on, they need theatre, okay? And particularly in children, you don't mess around. You know, if there's, if there's any ongoing bleeding, they haven't got as much blood to lose, get them to theatre and stop the bleeding, okay? Strider, so people get confused as to what Strider is, okay? Strider and Sturter, two different things. Sturter is your snorry, gurgly guy next to you on the train has fallen asleep and is snoring. That's Sturter, okay? That's different from Strider, which is a high-pitched, 
inspiratory, uh, classically inspiratory sound, kind of like a uh, uh. So that is a sign that the airway is compromised, that the lower airway is compromised, okay? So that's what strider, so get clear what strider is. So strider, airway is at risk, manage the airway, worry about the cause later, okay? So obviously involve senior help early, flexible nasendoscopy will help you to see the larynx in adults in children better to wait until senior help arrives and just keep them calm and still the reason for that is because the, the ch a, a baby's airway is very narrow at its narrowest it can be as much as four millimeters so if they've lost three already you don't want to knock off that last millimeter and and go from a a bad situation to a to a terrible one so otherwise the usual recess principles apply oxygen steroids adrenaline nebs airway maneuvers and essentially then a decision has to be made quite quickly as to whether a patient needs intubating or whether a surgical airway is needed and that really depends on how bad the situation is how long you think you've got to play with before things are going to go downhill and uh, what exactly is causing it, which hopefully you'll see on flexible nasendoscopy. And the sorts of things that can cause airway obstruction tend to be different in children than they are in adults. So very, in, in adults, it's, you often see people that have left their laryngeal cancers very late and they come in obstructed or bilateral vocal cord palsy from a neurological cause. In children, it's often crew and foreign bodies really. Um, acute epiglottitis is much more rare now because of vaccinations that are available. Good, okay. So tracheostomies, again, whole topic in itself, but we do a tracheostomy to get an airway here when this area is either obstructed or we're expecting it to be obstructed. So either there's a big tumor up here or someone's gonna have radiotherapy and the, we think that the airway is going to get worse so real obstruction and impending airway obstruction you can also do it when classically patient has been intubated on ITU for a long time and the only way of removing their tube is to stick a trachea in anyway so that's probably the commonest reason we do a trachea for prolonged ventilation and much more rarely for for toilet so for suctioning of the lower airways okay so um Again, it's probably too much to sort of explain this in great detail, but to do a trachea, it's an incision. Here, you have to split the investing layer of fascia, the strap muscles, divide the thyroid isthmus, and then make a window in the trachea. And, um, and then you, if there's an endotracheal tube in, you pull it back and stick the tracheostomy tube in. Okay. And um, this is obviously important to understand this because if you ever get called to resuscitate someone like this you want to know whether you want to be putting oxygen in here or in here or both um so i'll probably leave that there that's another whole topic in itself but an important one right so we're coming towards the end top decile question i was asked to put in a top decile question so um my specialist area is hearing and ears and one of the things i do is um, i'm part of the cochlear implant team um, and we do cochlear implant surgery for people with profound deafness. So um, here's a video of someone um, having her implant switched on for the first time. Now, in reality, it's, it, it's not always that emotional, but um, I guess I put that in uh, to sort of, you know, you get such little exposure to ENT, but it is actually, obviously I'm biased, but you know, there's lots of great things you can, you can do in this specialty. So um, anyway, so not expecting anyone to get this, but um, let's put the last question on. Which of the following would not currently be eligible for a cochlear implant on the NHS in the UK? So the criteria vary between countries. So apologies for anyone tuning in from abroad. Oh, 
I'll give you a bit longer to do that. There's a question about cholesteatoma, so I'll cover that in next week's lecture, which I think the guys are going to advertise um, in the next few days. <laughs> okay, right. I'm going to finish it in five seconds. Okay, good. So, interesting. I thought this might. Um, this might sort of sway people in the wrong way. It's a difficult one. So let's go through them. Eight month old baby. So the, the key thing about uh, qualifying for a cochlear implant in the UK is that both ears need to be profoundly deaf. Now we'll, we'll get into the frequency. You know, it, 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 there are frequency criteria, but broadly speaking, both ears have to be affected. That's not the same in other countries. Age is no barrier. So the 102 year old, you know, that is bilaterally deaf, He's socially isolated, he wants to hear better, he can, he can have one. Um, the one that can't have one here, therefore, is the unilateral um, hearing loss in the UK. So, so that's, that's why, that's the correct answer. So a two-year-old with unilateral hearing loss wouldn't qualify for a cochlear implant routinely. Good, okay. Uh, let's just close that. Good, so in the UK, the NICE guidelines were updated last year. You need to have bilateral hearing loss at 80 decibels or worse in two frequencies and also inadequate benefit from conventional hearing aids. And there's a whole MDT assessment involved in deciding if cochlear implants are suitable involving us, audiology, speech therapy, radiology, psychology, teachers of the deaf, um, and um, I'm going to stick a, a bite-sized video explaining this on my Instagram um, in the coming weeks. So look out for that. Good. So that's about it. I thought I'd just also touch on, on ENT as a specialty because you get such little exposure to it at med school. And I think because of that, a lot of people, you know, they generally become junior doctors and just go into what they know and fair enough. Um, and a lot of trainees discovery NT fairly late for that reason and it's already fairly competitive but I would probably imagine it'd be even more competitive if people actually knew about it early enough and um, you know so it's it's not all snot and bogey I'll tell you the reasons I went into ENT um, the age range of patients so we look after the newborns right up until over a hundreds and um, you know, we're looking after patients' senses, so hearing, smell, um, voice, and that has a huge impact on people's quality of life. And, you know, I think being, we actually operate on more children than any other surgical specialty. And I think that also shapes the kind of people that go into this because, um, you know, you need to be, you know, to be, you need to be good with kids, you need to be personable. So, um, wide variety of cases, so obviously ear, nose and throat, they're all very different. Every day is different as a trainee. Um, and, uh, you know, so everyone has, has their niche. And, and so, you know, you're never, you're never bored from that perspective. Making people better quickly. So as the, even as the SHO on call, you are very practically using your skills to sort people and get them better, whether it's fixing their nosebleed with, with the skills I've just told you about, draining a Quincy, generally you can fix people and get them home without even speaking to the registrar. That is very satisfying. It's very different from other specialties where you might, you know, it might take a lot of ward rounds to, to get people's biochemical markers to where you want them or their blood pressure. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's high impact medicine, which is kind of why you wanted to go into medicine after all, to, you know, to, to make people better and have an impact and make a difference. So, um, so that was another reason. Gadgets, so obviously I haven't touched on all of those in this lecture, but get to use loads of gadgets. And um, surgery is really 
challenging and intricate. I spend most of my time operating down a microscope, um, you know, a millimeter away from the facial nerve, a few millimeters away from the carotid artery. Um, but, um, but also it has an emotional, um, you know, an emotional impact on, on the patients. So clinics also, you know, you really see, you know, the, the, the impact of someone coming and saying, you know, I can hear again and it's changed my life. You know, that's the sort of patient, uh, that's sort of job satisfaction that, that keeps you going. Um, and finally look at the consultant. So, you know, whatever you choose to do, it's very easy to be swayed by, you know, a, a keen trainee, but look at the consultants and ask yourself, do you enjoy your life? You know, can you smile or are you, you know, are you grunting at me, you know, in, in the corner of the room? So um, I say that in jest, but, um, you know, I think ENT generally is full of uh, you know, friendly people that um, work really hard, but also appreciate the importance of work-life balance. Um, they you know, it's a small specialty, so we all know each other around the country. Um, and I think, you know, the whole working with kids thing also has a big impact. Um, so, you know, whatever you choose, uh, ask yourself, um, you know, do I want to be that person in my thirties and forties? And, um, I think of all the surgical specialties, we, we probably have the, 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 the sort of closest ratio of male to female. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and I think, obviously I think that that could get better and, and it is getting better, but I looked recently at the, the trainees in, um, North north london and it is actually nearly a 50 50 split so and i think that can only be a positive thing good okay i think i'll um, pause there um i started in, uh, that instagram recently and um i've sort of been putting some educational stuff on it so feel free to check that out and um, for anyone that wants to go into ent um these textbooks um are fairly well used by the trainees around the country so um look out for those um happy to answer any questions um azim for, yeah. so thank you so so much that was an amazing amazing lecture webinar um i think we all know who stole the show but you were good too <laughs> no that, I, I learned so much and i'm sure everyone uh, here did as well so thank you once again it was an honor and we look forward to having you back next week so everyone i hope you all follow Joe on Instagram, Ear Surgeon Joe. He's got some great stuff there as well. And take a look at his textbooks. Um, but yeah, I mean, Joe's very kindly agreed to run a Q&A now. Um, so yeah, feel free to ask your questions. And also, you know, as always, if you'd like to get involved with bite medicine, pop us an email, um, join our Facebook group, etc. as well. Um, so yeah, we'll bring the chat up. And um, Joe, yeah, I guess... I'm sure there are going to be hundreds of questions being fired. I guess uh, we can try and tr try and work your way through and pick any that stick out. Well, thank you for the great feedback as well, because obviously I can't see any of you. So, um, yeah. and I wasn't keeping an eye on the chat during the thing. So, uh, good to know that it was useful. So that's that's great. Um, right, I'm just there are so many. I'm just going to have to pick some. Um, do I know BSL? I don't, but. It's a really useful skill to have, and I wish I had taken that chance in med school. So, if you have the option to learn BSL, um, really good thing to have. Favorite procedure to perform as an ENT consultant? Um, so, a, probably cochlear implantation is one, stapedectomy is another. So, those are two operations that you can really transform hearing, and certainly stapedectomy, because I do it under local anesthetic, you can actually see the hearing improvement on the table, which is um, which is great. Um, would night pain in the ear with a slightly inflamed external ear canal always be suspicious of necktizing a tight externa? So it's an, it's an index of suspicion. I think I would think about it when you've got an immunocompromised patient. That's usually where you see it most. So diabetic or someone that's had chemotherapy or, or um, you know, it's that sort of scenario really. Um, Okay. Physician's associate role in ENT. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a very practical specialty. Um, we're always looking for, you know, people to fill that great, um, you know, very va valuable junior role um, and, and middle grade role. Um, 
and yeah i mean you know you don't really cover ent very much at med school so there's no there's nothing stopping anyone from learning these skills um after graduation and in fact my first ent job was as a ct1 so i didn't do it for foundation training so um so that should encourage anyone uh if after viral tonsillitis the tonsil does not go down in size again do you do anything or do you just live with a bigger tonsil okay so an, an uninflamed tonsil can still be big the size of the tonsil is not a reason alone to do a tonsillectomy and take them out but generally big tonsils will um, usually lead to a couple of problems one recurrent infections and two um, starting to obstruct the airway and cause sleep apnea so those are the two reasons why you might think about um, taking the tonsils out. Sleep apnea, you know, really more applies to children, although sometimes in adults as well. Obviously, if one tonsil starts growing and growing, then you want to think about malignancy. Uh, how do you balance the work-life balance? Okay, well, you know, uh, everything is doable. So, yeah, I mean, I always encourage my trainees to have a healthy work-life balance. Um, I uh, played in a band throughout my training and still do. So um, everything's, everything's, you know, possible. Um, maybe not logging onto a lecture on a Saturday night is a great way of having a work-life balance, but I'm really glad that you all, you all logged on, obviously. Um, there's no football on and there's no X Factor on, so what else? would we all want to be doing. Uh, what med school did you study at? I studied at Bristol. And um, what's the training pathway for ENT? So uh, you do your foundation years one and two. You don't have to do ENT during that time. During F2, you would apply for core surgical training, although they are also phasing in a run through from ST1 onwards. So there are two pathways. You either apply to ENT and run straight ST1 to eight, so the eight year training, or you do core training, two years, and then apply for an ST3 job and, and then do three, four, five, six, seven, eight. After ST8, you could be ready to apply for a consultant job, or if you want to do something niche, um, generally you do a fellowship. So I did a um, auditory implant fellowship in Cambridge and then was appointed to my consultant job. So that's that's usually the the pathway. Um, should I carry on? Should I keep answering questions? What are you worried about with unilateral sudden sensory hearing loss? Okay, so losing your hearing in one ear has a massive impact. Probably we underplay it, but if you if you know if you block your ear off, you're going to be okay one to one. But as soon as there's a lot of background noise, you're going to struggle. Um, and you you know having two good hearing ears helps you to figure out where sound is coming from you'd be surprised how much it affects your spatial awareness. So, you know, someone coming up behind you. Um, so, so you lose hearing in one ear, that is, that, is, um, that is a significant thing. And the reason we want to treat sudden hearing loss early is because we know that giving steroids early is your, is, gives you your best hope of recovery. And even then, not all of the sudden sensory neural hearing losses recover. Um, so, um, but, but that's, that's why you want to give them the best chance. Of, of recovering. So do you want to take maybe one, one or two more? Otherwise, I feel like you'll be here all night. No, sure. Do you want to pick one for me? Because yeah, I, I absolutely. feel like I'm, I may yeah. have, uh, I may have sure. ignored some good questions. No, let me, uh, let me, let me have a look at one. Um, I, I, this question, what, does the type of cochlear implant have any influence on the age of the baby? Multi-channel implants, for example. Okay. So, the, the, the key thing about doing cochlear implants for babies is the earlier you do it, so in the first few years of life, that your brain is learning how to interpret sound and understand language and, and enable you to speak. So the earlier we restore hearing with cochlear implants in a baby that's profoundly deaf, the, the more time the brain has to develop. And if you don't give sound to a baby for the first four or five years of their life, then even if you restore the hearing later, they won't go on to develop verbal speech. So, so early cochlear implantation is, is, 
is important. Now, choosing your implant will often depend on the anatomy. Um, that you, so, so in terms of the brand, you know, there, there are four different brands. We treat them all re you know, relatively similar. They, each of them has different, slightly different um, electrodes. And generally, you know, we'll have our go-to electrode, standard electrode. But if the anatomy is quite um, unusual, we might have a reason to, to choose a slightly more curved electrode or whatever. But um, otherwise, you know, it's really about um, timing rather than the actual specific implant itself. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, th we'll take one more. I'm seeing this question quite a bit. I'm not sure if it's from the same person. Um, I think it's referring to the child with unilateral discharge. Um, why are we checking eye signs in, in that child? Okay, so um, the nasal cavity is obviously next to the eye. So if you've got an acute sinusitis or an inflammation causing nasal discharge, you want to make sure that it's not affecting the eye because you can get abscesses and cellulitis, well, periorbital and orbital cellulitis, which compromise vision. So if you've got someone with a blocked nose, nasal discharge, and they've lost their color vision, that is a sign that they are about to lose their eyesight and you need to act on that promptly with IV antibiotics, nasal decongestant, nasal steroids, and possibly a scan and, and theater. So, so yeah, so essentially um, any nasal inflammation, you want to be making sure that the eyes are not affected. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Joe. Once again, I think we'll call it a day there. Um, yeah. Once again, thank you everyone for turning up on this it's pretty rainy and stormy here, but wherever you are around the world, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm sure there's lots of other things you could be doing on a Saturday evening. Um, as I said, please, you know, follow Joe on Instagram. Um, he's got an incredible webinar coming up next week with a special announcement for that webinar coming out, uh, I think, tomorrow. Um, but yeah, thank you so much once again, Joe, um, and we look forward to seeing you next week.